Hello and welcome to this edition of People, Politics and Power. I am Imoni Amarere. It's been 29 long years since Nigerians voted in what is arguably the freest and fairest election ever conducted in Nigeria. June 12, 1993 marked a watershed in Nigeria's political history. The election was the outcome of a 10-year transition process from military to civilian rule, now referred to as the Third Republic. The process seemed to be moving on very well until the sudden annulment, 12 days after the election on June 24, 1993. Many critical observers and analysts of that political era have said that the June 12, 1993 election remains a major signpost of inclusive and participatory democracy in Nigeria. That election is credited with blurring some deep cleavages, such as our ethno-religious fault lines and demolishing North-South dichotomy. These were made manifest by the cross-cutting outcome of the presidential election from all around the country, which was won by Bashonu M.K. Abiola. It seemed like the dawn of a new Nigeria and the rebirth of democracy, which guarantees the, birth, the rights of Nigerians to make free choices. But it was never allowed to be. Now, President Muhammadu Buhari made allusions to this political landmark in his last Democracy Day broadcast, which made on Sunday. 1993, Nigerians saw the best in our citizens as we all went to, out to vote peacefully. By June 24th, 1993, we also saw the worst of our leadership as the elections were annulled. We must never forget the sacrifices of the heroes of Nigeria's democracy during 1993, their patriotism and peace. them accountable now and in future. Fellow Nigerians, this is my last Democracy Day speech as your president. By June 12, 2023, exactly one year from today, you will already have a new president. I remain committed and determined to ensure that the new president is elected through a peaceful and transparent process. It is important for all of us to remember that June 12, 2023 will be exactly 30 years from 1993 presidential elections. In honor and memory of one of our national heroes for democracy, Chief MKO Abiola, GCFR, we must all work together to ensure this transition is done in a peaceful manner. I am hopeful that we can achieve this. The signs so far are positive. Recently, all registered political parties conducted primaries to select their candidates for the 2023 general elections. These primaries were peaceful and orderly. Those who won were magnanimous in their victories. Those who lost were gracious in defeat. And those aggrieved opted to seek judicial justice as opposed to jungle justice. Okay, like you heard from the president there yeah, in February 2023, almost 30 years after June 12, 1993, Nigerians will be going to the polls to elect a new president after more than 23 years of unbroken civil rule. Now, what positive lessons 
have been learned in all this time? What lessons have we left unlearned? What has civil rule delivered to the country and to its peoples in over two decades of democracy? Did June 12 teach politicians, their supporters and their cheerleaders anything new? Has it impacted in any way on how politics is played? Has it impacted on the conduct of elections over the years? And will it have any effect on the 2023 elections? Given that almost a similar political scenario in terms of party candidates is being presented and is playing out to Nigerians at the moment. These are some of the questions and issues that we will be chewing on on the program today. What lessons from 1993 till now and until 2023 in February when Nigerians again go to the polls to elect a new president? Join us in a moment as we meet our analysts and guests in the studio to take a look at all of these. Let's get to meet our analysts, our guests right here in the studio, two of them. First, uh, from my immediate left is Dr. Chima Amadi. Dr. Amadi is a political scientist and he is the chairman, a board of directors of the Center for Transparency Advocacy, CTA. Thank you so much, Dr. Amadi, again, for coming. Man. Also joining us is Professor Yusufu Zwaka. Professor Zwaka is a political science lecturer at the University of Abuja here in the nation's capital. Thank you, Prof, for finding time to join us. Thank you. Well, welcome. Quite some time, Dr. Amadi. It's been a while. Right. <laughs> We've been hibernating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now you were in the thick of the June 12th struggle, proud before and after the June 12th elections. Let's begin by relieving some of your experiences and what those experiences have taught any one of us, if any, over the years. That's right. Um, it's, it's just like yesterday, when as an impressionable young man, um, we were on the streets in traversing Lagos and, um, and Ibadan, as a student at the University of Ibadan then. And um, I, I can recall vividly some of the events whether it is the events that triggered, that led to the annulment and the rejection of that annulment by, by Nigerians. And then the outpouring of, of anger on the streets all over Nigeria. Um, then the, the, the emotions, because the 10-year the uh, transition had built up a lot of emotions in Nigerians. Whether you talk about the several cancellations, banning of politicians, if you recall then, new breed and old breed politicians, the gerrymandering by then military, head of the military junta, uh, Ibrahim Babangida, and then finally looked as if we have gotten it right, just to be welcome with an annulment. People were genuinely angry and trooped to the streets. I, and I recall many incidents of open live fire shots. Uh, whether it is on Qatar Bridge, on the Co Bridge, and different places, you know, and the events after then that you know led to the death of so many heroes. You talk about the life of Pa Alfred Ruani, Kudra Tabela, and many others that died. And um, of course, shortly after then, the the head of the junta stepped aside, and you had a, a reenactment, an attempt by the junta again, they continued by the Abacha to sustain power which also was confronted by, by the, the, the mass of the Nigerian people led by activists on ground then. And then that led finally to, you know, the, it, the transition and that gave birth to this to the democracy now. And, and so I, I, as an individual, uh, if you recall to just less than two years ago, when you would think that one of the lessons would be that any ruling, any administration would have respect for the need for people to vent their anger peacefully, protest peacefully without molestation. And that would be one of the, if it's any lesson learned. But however, uh, two years ago, 
we learned of reports of you know military men opening fire on on a group of young people protesting the police brutality as it were the so-called answers and uh, uh, protests and so it left a very sore taste in my mouth having participated and witnessed and seen be, you know we shot at life and i also understand that it is very easy for the line for civic space you know to be constricted and that it, it, it takes just a little a very little thing to move between dictatorship and like we witnessed about most 30 years ago in a military regime and resent for you know democratic norms even by in a democratic government and some of them you also see them playing up in different forms whether it is uh, not allowing the press to be completely free you as was as, as we noticed then and you ask yourself is the press really free now so these are some of the lessons you begin to ask yourself however has there been movement of course there have been big movements you know uh we've had almost near two decades of uninterrupted civil rule and we have always said that if you allow politicians, no matter how flawed, to fall and stand up, to make mistakes, democracy will be better for it. And like I said, that the best military rule is not anywhere compared to the worst form of democracy. And it's seen, we are seeing it play out now. Politicians are making mistakes. They are learning for their mistakes. The judiciary is stepping up to the, to the play. We are seeing corrections. And then we are seeing incremental improvements in the democratic process. Are we there yet? No. Are we going to get there eventually? Every, democr every democracy in the world has its own challenges. But the most important thing is that allow the democratic process to play out, no matter how. And when it plays out well, you will see the benefits of you know, civil rule and its best. I hope and wish that we do not return to the era of military rule because I tell you, comrade, like you know, I mean, you're on the streets with us. It is not anything to write to me about. We lost very good men because of uh, this uh, the, the military dictatorship. Mm. Prof, they say political scientists like you are recorders of history. Maybe in a hurry or in a comprehensive manner, you, you have been around. You have been part of Nigeria's political history. Are there any significant takeaways from 1993 to now, 29 years after, that you think have made any positive impact on our uh, political life? Well, for me, uh, I think uh, if you look at the, the June 12 elections, even the preceding it, before the elections, you saw how the political parties, the two parties, the SDP, NRC, how they were organized and how they had to produce, you know, their flag bearers, that, those that contested that election. It, they went through a very difficult process. It's not like what you're having now. All you need to get money, go and buy from, no. They went, they started from the world, to the local government level, to the state, before they appeared nationally to, and were elected by delegates that were they themselves elected right from the grassroots. So at that time you had, the, 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 even though it was an imposed, you know, system because the two parties were decreed into existence, you know, by the military. But even at that, you still, you, you find that, you know, the practice in terms of, you know, how democracy actually played out, people were largely involved you know, in that process in trying to select the leaders compared to what we are seeing now. So if there's any lesson that we should learn, if, and most of these politicians that are currently playing politics in Nigeria, a large chunk of them were present or actually participated even during that period. And so therefore, I'm, I'll be surprised why they're not willing, you know, to really subject themselves, open up the political parties. You now find some of the parties have even closed, you know, for membership. People are trying to register to become members of their party. They're not interested in allowing new members because of the kind of things that they've seen. And so I think if you look at the political parties, I think, and that is why we're supposed to really learn a big lesson that, you know, the political parties are supposed to be organized and they should be able to organize themselves internally because if they cannot practice democracy within the party, it will be difficult for them, for them to practice it outside their parties. And that's why you see that now there's a, you know, the big spenders, so to say, are the ones that are leading in most of the parties. And that, how, that means that if you are, you cannot be said, you, you can't say you're a citizen if you cannot aspire to any office. Then you are not a citizen. It means you're a slave. And there's a difference between a slave and a citizen. And so therefore, I think what, will happen, what is happening now is that there's, you know, a, a grand plan and design to virtually remove more than 89% of Nigerians from their citizenship. And the citizenship is being restricted by just 11% of the people who are also you know, when you now go further, you see that only 1% or 2% are 
are really in control of the entire political you know, institution. And so therefore, we cannot you know, be moving in that way and think that we have to be learning by you know, making deliberate mistakes. Because all these mistakes are deliberate. They are not, uh, you, you are having a party, you are going to have members. We saw in some of the conventions that recently held that in some of the parties, they had to go and hire delegates from uh, some states will have delegates, not members of those states, representing them in a, in a convention. We saw that even with the major party, you saw a prominent Nigerian, a former minister, who was not from the eastern part of Nigeria, appearing with APC logo in the east. How do you continue to play politics like that and say you are playing politics? No. I think we should be serious with what we are doing. Well, there is no seriousness on the part of the political leaders, and I think that is part, part of the problem we're having. When you take Abiola, for instance, this is somebody who has made his money in a very clean manner. Everybody knew that he's a businessman, a very successful businessman, and he learned trophies. And he reached out to virtually all parts of the country. And he's not somebody who is selective. Even in his businesses, several you know, people are employed, not based on anything, based on their competence. You know, so you, 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 you see there's a clear difference between what transpired at that time. And that's why even when the elections were conducted, Tova was rejected in his own... Uh, in his own community, and Abiola was, was, was elected. Not for anything, not that money was used or anything, that like we find what, what is playing out now, where people are really ready to spend their, their life, you know, uh, whatever money they have, just to, because they are, there's desperation, you know, to get into the office, simply because of this prebendal politics that we're playing, you know, in Nigeria. And of course, the fact that, you know, there's no any serious, uh, you know, uh, challenge to what, you know, the politicians are doing. So virtually they have a, it's like they've gotten a gold mine and they're not willing to allow anybody to come close to it. That's what is happening. Mm. Uh, Dr. Amadi, mm. let me take you back to what Professor just talked about now, the processes at that time. Within the political parties themselves, the selection process at that time, how rigorous it was compared to what it is now, for instance. We had the option A4, for instance. We had the open secret balloting system and the, uh, the, the, the process such that to emerge the presidential candidate of a political party you started from the world to the local government to the state levels and not with this uh, delegates uh, system that we have now uh, at the national level as has as just been demonstrated with all the political parties here now one seemed to be more rigorous and more grassroots oriented than the other. Again, there is also the issue of party discipline, which you talked about now. It doesn't appear as if there is as much party discipline today as it was before and during the 1993 elections, even with the two imposed political parties. Now, if we, if, we, if we look at that critically, can we say that we have m made some incremental progress in terms of the democratic process, the internal party democratic process between then and now? I beg to disagree, and I will give you reasons, empirical reasons. Uh, first of all, let us make one point clear. The modes of determining can the recruitment and candidate selection is strictly the sole business and determined by the political parties. It is um, a famous um, political scientist in America clearly stated, um, Sean Peter, very clearly that the business of political parties to determine the way and process they recruit, you know, leadership candidates, candidates in their parties. It could be any way. Any way you want it, it could be the delegate system, it could be the option A4, it could be any way you want it. But the problem we have always had is that you have political parties disregarding their own rules. Even the delegate system that is being lampooned now, is if you follow the rules, it's such that it carries along members from the grassroots. Because the process starts from the wards. Where you conduct members in the, in the parties conduct some kind of elections to elect delegates from there. And then from that place, you move to the local government, to, to congresses, to the state congresses before you go to national. Now, these parties have in their constitutions, you will see they have what they call the direct and indirect system. The direct system is where, you know, members, all members line up and determine and they, they vote like you have mini elections. But 
you also have rules. There, has, there are rules, institutions guiding these principles. So the rules include you must have the members of your political parties. INEC must be giving this member the list of your members. These members must be known their addresses, their phone numbers before you conduct that. Not the shenanigan we see. We have people, you know what we see. I mean, we don't want to belabor that. So the point is, these political parties disobey their own rules, and that is why you see a lot of litigations. In the last election, there were over 690 pre-election matters based on candidate selection, people re rejecting the processes. Now, in 1993 and before that, if you recall, and we don't want to, you know, for those of us who are present here, let us not tell young Nigerians that, oh, it was all oh, beautiful. If you recall, the military had to cancel many of the party primaries because they accused them of being taken over by money mongers and money bags. That was why a whole generation of politicians then were, were banned by the military, tagging them as um, old breed politicians that they have, politic they have monetized the process, which now led to a new breed that brought in somebody like Abiola, somebody like Tofa, and new names. That ban was what led to the, to the banning of somebody like late General Adua, if you recall, and some, like Adam Uchiromas, of the, 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 I mean, Adam Uchiromas and the, the rest of them, because they were accused of monet monetizing the process. Even the offshore air force we are talking about, at the end of the day, it was those who had the capacity because it was heavily monetized. One of the reasons for the, uh, for the annulment was the military claiming that the process was monetized, you know, vote buying and all that. Of course, we knew it is neither here nor there. There is no election that is perfect. But the point was that that, that that period, because you had the military with gone, making sure that the rules were respected. So politicians respected the rules. In, two, in 1998, the transition was, you know, midwife by the military. You could say that the first 10 years of democracy, that the 1998 elections made more sense than even elections that followed after, with the deterioration of INEC before 2011, that President Jonathan brought on sanity by bringing in somebody like Atahiru, Atahiru Jega. So the point is that the leadership, the recruitment, the candidate selection system is, a, is the, one of the means that le, 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 you know, political parties determine who represents them. And they have their rules. But in Nigeria, that rule has always been disobeyed. That rule has always been neglected, leading to what you have now. And then, again, our elections, what the military tried to do before there was to sponsor political parties to reduce the effect of money, you know, by money, money bags. But how did that fare? How has it fared? The, the, the Congress nature of elections in Nigeria and the way the system, the way the, the presidential system is structured, is a very, a, a very expensive process. That at the end of the day, if political parties don't, add, you know, organize themselves, where members begin to donate, begin pay their dues, and then a way of, you know, funding elections is, is entrenched. We have it in our laws, donations and all that. But what do you have here? When the donations are called, you have people breaching the donation process, right? People, companies that are not even supposed to be part of the process becoming part of the process. So the rules are there to be followed. And if you follow these rules, you will see that it allows for the grassroots participation, whether it is the indirect system or whether it is the direct, the direct system. However, the problem is, at some point, the list is known only to the national secretary or the organizing secretary in, Abu, uh, in, the, in the national headquarter. Who guides this list so shrouded in secrecy that people like, and like Prof said, People now buy names of this list, import people to come and assume names who go to vote. So as long as you, you don't obey the process put in place by a party, no matter the process you put in place, it is not going to be transparent. So uh, what, what hope does that hold for us, Prof, if between 1999, when we returned to democratic rule, and now there has been a deterioration of respect for party rules, for party guidelines, and for democratic ethos, even within the political parties. It then tells us that, you know, we have a long way to go. Because uh, if the political parties, the, you know, the par why we emphasize the political parties? Because the parties are supposed to control the people are, that are elected into various offices, whether they are legislature or they are in the executive. But if the party cannot control them, it is rather the executive that are controlling the party. You could see what the National Assembly tried to do in trying to maybe remove this statutory delegates, they remove themselves, remove the uh, executive. And then they, they, that's a lawmaking body, which should know that you know, there are certain criteria that are used in making laws. And part of it is that you don't discriminate against any group. You don't make law targeting a particular group of people. If you are going to make laws, the laws must be universal. They must have some universal applicability. 
the laws must also have some kind of certainty that they will be obeyed. And they must not be ultra biased. You must work within the limits of your own uh, system. Now, the, you, you see the executive trying to control the party and trying to install you know, those that will be party officials so that they continue to you know, just bring them up as the, we know of you know, what, what transpired recently is really a, it's a shame because you find some states. The governors purchased the, the nomination funds for senators, for House of Rest. They gave it to their own cronies and they, because they, are, they want to recruit the House of Assembly. Then later, any pa they now, ha if the person is leaving, he now brings in somebody as a stooge to now continue to, so that he'll be governing the place indirectly. It's a kind of continuation of his own government, even though he's not the one there. Because he installed all of them with the House of Assembly. You know, so you can't be, we can't be saying we're well, making any progress with that kind of system, unfortunately. And even though we know that, yes, they are supposed to correct themselves, but from all indication, and because there's less pressure from the society, civil society, of course they are doing what they like. And then the citizens are virtually docile, they don't, you know, uh, care who, who governs them, even though they now begin to see that, look, they must pay, you know, attention and interest, you know, what is happening, uh, you know, with the government, because if they don't go out to vote, then any person can emerge as, as the leader, and then he does what he likes, and then their lives cannot be secured, they cannot go to school, they cannot get employed. S all the things that are supposed to be given, you know, in several countries that are developing, are completely absent here. They are not working on anything to ensure that, you know, they provide electricity, or ensure that there are good roads, or ensure that the schools are functioning, or even the hospitals are functioning. We know when they have a headache, they get out of the country, they have the means. All they do is to get, you know, the funds from the government, because there's no accountability, there's no transparency, the rule of law is gone, there's nothing. No equity, no inclusiveness. People just take over the government and then they just do what they like. This is a very dangerous situation that we're in. And I think it is not good for the politicians. I've been saying that, look, they need to address themselves. Because we can't continue like this. Citizens are suffering. You can't move from one point, point A to point B, you are kidnapped. Every year, 50, 60 people are being butchered, left, right, and center. Under a democracy, then we say we are making progress. What sort of progress is that? I think... One of the primary responsibilities of government is just that protection of lives and property. Even if you're not going to do anything to anybody, protect his life and protect the little property that he has. And I think the person will not have any you know, issue. That in itself we are not able to do. Because some of the things that they will have done now is that will have, there will have been some administrative decisions that will have been made. You don't need any, you don't need to recruit more people or all that, but you need to re-strategize on what you're doing. You take the local governments. I've said this severally. How can people be living? And there's no house numbering, no street naming. Nobody knows why, who is where. And you want to have security. Then you are joking. There's no country you go to. As you arrive, you pay city tax because they have to take money from you to run the city. Because there are buses, there are, you know, sewage, there are everything, water, electricity. That are it's not free. And you can't, if you are spending three days, you must pay. Every day you pay city tax. Here we just move up and down. No, nobody's paying anything. People are settling, taking over all the forests. You can't move to the farms. You can't stay at home. Anywhere you go to, you're insecure. I mean, we're, this democracy, they need to sit down, really. It's not just about elections. We know, yes, we have to get... Uh, INEC has given them a very long period of time. And, you know, the process has even changed. A lot of them don't even know that the things they've been doing before has changed. There's no longer what they're used to. Now they have to upload their candidates. And I just pray that they have a system where they will link their wire to NECO, to all those, you know, examination bodies. So that anybody come with fake, fake result. Have an issue from the point of view uploading your nomination, you have failed. You can't get in into the system. Then you know that you because they must be taught, they, 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 they have refused to discipline themselves. Then they need somebody else to discipline them. Because you cannot run a system like this where people just do what they like and nobody is taking uh, you know over, overseeing their own affairs. You have to have some kind of you know institution that should be able to take that responsibility. All right, we'll be back in a moment, and when we return, we'll be looking doing some kind of comparison between the electoral umpire uh, as, as it was in 1993 and what it is today. Stay with us. Thank you so much for staying with us. My guests are Dr. Chima Amadi, a political scientist and chairman, board of directors of the Center for Transparency Advocacy, CTA, and Professor Isufu Zwaka, who is a political science lecturer at the University of Abuja here in the nation's capital. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Now, before we went on the break, Dr. Awadi, you made allusion to the interventionist role that the military played in 
1993 era, how it disqualified certain uh, aspirants, certain candidates, certain individuals from participation in the electoral process at that time based on one criteria or the other, and uh, the role that the electoral body at that time played. The electoral body uh, could be argued was not as independent as it is today. Yet, under this independent electoral commission, we have seen a lot of uh, a lot of things, a lot of issues that Prof referred to, uh, how money seems to be dictating the pace, and how people or politicians are carrying on as if there are no rules, even when their party constitutions and manifestos are registered with the electoral body. Yes, um, we, we need to put in context the word independence because um, sometimes we tend to forget that independence is a relative thing. Uh, in 1993, you had the, the neck by Humphrey Wonsu and to show you to the extent of the, its lack of independence, the military could you know, with, with a fiat and all the elections, and he couldn't move further. Not until five years ago did, did uh, Humphrey wants to release the results of the 1993 uh, elections, finally, in his book, uh, while he published the results. Of course, we already knew the, the results, but he made a show of publishing the results. Now, to that extent, you could say, well, that no, in fact, the new electoral act makes it impossible, not even for a court to stop INEC, once the process, electoral process, is in motion. Uh, the, the appointments of, of even the, the uh, national commissioners, you could see some level of broad participation between the, the executive and the, uh, the le legislature. So to give you some form of you know, uh, independence, as it were. However, that is where it stops. Because the INEC cannot do certain things. It's not independent. Look. The money that it is going to use to conduct elections is going to come from somewhere, the executive, isn't it? The road is going to ply to, to make sure that logistics, you know, gets to different... It's supposed to be constructed by the, the, by the executives. The waterways and all that, security, but it can't do this on its own. So, to that extent, it's really not independent in the purest sense of the world because it still has to depend on other arms of, of, of government. It has to depend on the legislature to pass the electoral act and all that. But having said that, you could see... If you travel around Nigeria, you see the craze, you see the, the frantic effort by young Nigerians to get their PVC. What is that telling you? It is telling you that they, there's confidence, it, they are reposing confidence in the electoral umpire. They are seeing evidence that there is change. Since 1999, the INEC has been the only government institution that has made efforts to improve. If you recall, in 1999, the election was conducted with what we called a card reader, a 2D technology. The INEC, having looked at it, said, yeah, di di you know, dispose that, and has brought in what he calls the BIVAS, the Bimodal ver uh, 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 Verification um, uh, System, to verify, make sure that the issue, if you recall, the card reader had issues of, you know, identifying fingerprints. Now, they've, they've taken it a notch further. The beavers not only identifies your fingerprints, but also takes your pictures and transmits results automatically. They've, between 2019 and now, the INEC is now uploading you know, election results on, the, on, their, on their server so that as results are coming out, you are seeing it. You can see that in the comfort of your house, anywhere in the world, and you are seeing your, your results. What has that done? That, this, these changes and this you know, little bit of innovation using technology has brought a lot of confidence. So in places where normally they, before now, the umpire could just announce anybody. It's not happening. Votes are counting. And you could see the competition between, you know, uh, candidates. Unlike before when you see the difference between party A who won and party B being millions or hundreds of thousands. Now you are seeing elections where people are winning with 90, 50, 300. In Sokoto State, for example, the governor imagined less than 300 votes. You, you are seeing it clearly. You are seeing the, de the deployment of, of technology and how it is, you know, how it is bringing about confidence in the politics, and that is what we are seeing, and that's why Nigerians are calling for a postpone. I mean, a shift in the dates of registration because they are seeing that this thing is working. Can can they be better? Of course, they, there is always room for for imp improvements. Okay, I I believe that some of the 
responsibilities given to INEC by the constitution should be stripped of it so that it can concentrate on certain other responsibilities. For example, the mandate for it to prosecute electoral offenders. I th it doesn't even have the capacity to, to prosecute, to do that. You, I believe that that's, that aspect should be taken off it so it can concentrate on other things. Again, I also think that the time, the time within which, you know, uh, election takes place can be reduced if better technology is deployed. I don't know, I don't see reason why elections will start by 8 o'clock and late into the night, we're still collating and trying to, to transmit. These are issues that can be looked upon. But whether the umpire right now well, is... Are those not issues that uh, devolve around logistics, which you spoke about earlier on? Yes and no. Now, we have found out as observers that the problem with elections in Nigeria is not deployment. Look at deployment, you know, INEC has been able to, you know, conquer deployment up to 90%. So sometimes you see it by 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. They're already, they're already at their st stations. We also know that the problem is not even accreditation. Accreditation goes on smoothly. So now with Beavers, we expect to see, for example, just uh, last week, Beavers was tested in Ekiti, a mock election, and it returned 100%. So we expect that it should be better now. The problem has always been, people will also vote, but the problem has always been after counting, and now you now move to move from point A. You know how the access from the polling units, you now have to go to the wards, then from the wards, you move it to the local government, then from the local government, then you move the election results to the state. Within that period, that time frame it takes to move these things, that is when thugs and politicians become the what all what prof has described. That's when they unleash violence, that's when they kidnap INEC officials, that's when they you, you know what I'm talking about. And that is the period where election results are altered. So and that leading into elections, you know, taking place late in the night just because you are doing you are accredited. But now that Bivas now has the, the capacity to transmit results from the polling units. From the polling units. And now that the law, before now, the law, the Electoral Act did not allow INEC to you know, transmit. Now the law has used the word shall, meaning that both accreditation, well, verification, transmission, shall be, technology shall be used. So it now removes whatever you want to do. As long as it moves and people see it, sees it online, you know, that time frame can be reduced and then politicians will now know. Now that also brings its own problem. Because you now know that you can no longer use the umpire to rig elections or use security once voting has taken place, what do politicians do? Vote buying. So you now see now that money has come to play. In the last, in the, what you saw at the delegate selection, it's going to be a, a, it's going to be a chase play. Because people now want to buy votes, knowing that only, only people who cast their, their votes, and that is only what is going to count. So what is the empire supposed to do at this point in time, when even those helping the politicians to buy votes are the security agents that are supposed to ensure that this does not take place? Many times, security agents collude with party agents to induce and give them the enabling environment to buy votes. Be, and I, I think that because nobody has been prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law and gone to jail for inducing voters, that is why this thing will continue to play out. And until that happens, I don't see this receding any moment from now. Mm. Prof, I, I want to pack a number of issues in, in one. In, in 1993, the beavers did not exist. But the results of the June 12 elections in 1993 has been um, acclaimed to be very credible. There wasn't electronic transmission of results, but the results have been certified to be credible results. There weren't um, what you, the, the kind of violence that we see in elections these days, pre, during, and post election, was absent in 1993, June 12. It may have happened in other elections, but on, on June 12, the, the, the fear of violence was completely defeated. Everything seemed to have gone well. What, what happened then that cannot be replicated now? Well, I think first, uh, if you look at the electoral empire at that time, the next chairman, Professor Onfro Owosu, even after the military told him to stop publishing results, because in era 10, if you were in Abuja, you know that the results were being published. I was right there in yeah, front of published there yeah, openly in the, in the open. They stopped, it. they had to come and arrest him because he was ready to publish that result. He was doing a patriotic duty. 
He looked at it as a patriotic duty. Now you have a situation where, apart from Mike Igini in uh, Okai Bond, has been prosecuting some of these politicians, even polit you know, po po professors that rigged elections. I think one or two is in jail right now as we speak because he rigged election. So if people don't see any consequence for their misdemeanor, they will continue to do, to, to do that. But if they see that, you know, there will be sanctions, they will stop it. In 1993, I think you see the context is that there was this clamor. People had already were tired of military rule. And there was this clamor for, you know, a, a democratic system to come in. And so everybody was working towards the achievement. The direction, if you look at it, it was, it was not something as if you say, okay, you have all these divisions people are having now. No, they, these things were, were not there. Even if they were there, they were able to, you know, uh, you know, at least cover their ranks and then move together. And so therefore you had, you know, this uh, zeal to ensure that, you know, there was a democratic government. So everybody works towards achieving it because they know that if they should make any mistake, because from the, you know, I come at one time said, or oh, blessed memory, that uh, the transition program was elastic. And we said, look, elasticity even has its own limit because you cannot be drawing something as if it's rubber. It will just uh, cut at a point because you can't draw it any further. So he was saying that, you know, and that's why they kept changing the goalposts. They will go because they had their own interests outside. You know the fact that you know they they were looking for excuses, you know, not to allow for that uh, transition to take place. Because if you go and check very carefully, you see also there's this insinuation that you know there's this competition. You know, Gawan had ruled the country for about nine years. Uh, he's the longest uh, ruler of Nigeria. And some people are trying to break, break that record by whatever means. It's, it's a childish thing, but there is this ambition. So they kept, Babangi eventually spent eight years, and that's the end of it. He had to step aside. So at that time, I think Nigerians, generally, this issue about let's cheat and so on was not uh, as prominent as it is now. Now, on election day, people put leaves on their head that they're for sale. <laughs> if you don't pay them, they're not going to vote. So, but I think the, the scenario is changing now with this mad rush for voters' card. You know, if you look at the rush for registration, I think there is some movement and there could be an earthquake. The, the politicians may be there thinking that they will, it will mm -hmm. be business as usual. Yes, sure. And they may be surprised that That's right. maybe somebody who is even inconsequential, not being taken serious, may come up as, as the person elected. It's not impossible. Yeah. All that is required for the people to be determined, you know, to do the right thing. Because we have seen. We Except that Nigerians are also consumed by the fire brigade approach. Uh, registration of voters has been on for more than a year and then all, all of a sudden <laughs> less than one month to go you see every nigerian wanting to become to become a, a, a pvc holder yes i think uh, people may be doing it for different reasons of course if you have seen some delegates coming back with millions of naira some people will do it for different different, different reasons so everyone has his own reason but i think there's also a movement there's this push and a lot of uh, you know people are campaigning going to the youth and asking them to go and register. Whatever it will, it will turn out to be at the end of the day, because, you know, the election period is very long. And so there will be a lot of fatigue in the whole process. <laughs> People will get tired. If you're spending, you may get tired of spending, you know, in the process of uh, the elections. But at the end of the day, I think Nigerians may decide for themselves what they want, whether they want progress or they want retrogression, whether they want peace or they want all this insecurity to continue, because we have some of them are saying that they want continuity. Then people will be asking you, continuity of what? Banditry, kidnapping, lack of uh, fuel, price stability in uh, fuel. Is that what you want to continue? All this economic... Uh, you see, in, in countries, if you want to contest election, what they look at, if you are a governor, have you increased the per capita income of the people resident in your own community? They look at what have you brought in terms of economic growth in your own community. Not that you just come up and say, you are, moving, you are, you are stepping up to where? So a lot of these issues, I think, if you look at it, the 1993 electoral system, because of the way the elections itself was conducted, I remember in Adama State, in one of the elections, local government, one man queued up, his wife queued against his opponent. She went to the other party, queued behind, behind the other party, and he divorced her on the, on the field. Because, you see, at that, if you're a bad person, it's from the house. So you can't win from the house. Is it uh, when they present you to the public? You can't win there. You know, so the, you had a system that sieved out all these sort of characters. And then, of course, now I think they are even in a better position to ensure that, you know, they do a better job. Because they have largely the support of the government. The president made it in his speech that he wants to give a free and fair election. Which means there will be commitment towards ensuring that, you know, there is free and fair election. 
which means that it's not going to tolerate any person that may want to, sub, you know, sabotage the, the process. Let's see that happen. Let's see that actually translated into practical reality on ground, not just ending in television uh, statements, and that's it. Mm. So if, if there's real support for INEC, that means the funds that they require, the trainings that they should have done, the equipment that they require to use during the election, and even because there will be, you know, electronic transmission of results, and probably in the new law, there's no any, you know, place for incidents form again. That has been, you know, and therefore we will see the real voters. Then we will see the real numbers. Then we will know whether some people are using what to vote. Since you now have a system that, whether you are going to now steal the beavers and go and do, stay in your house and be snapping, snapping the wall of your house to do the voting, we don't know how you are going to get the results. Doc, uh, Ekiti Anoshun will be a test run yes. for 2023. Yes. How do you see that playing out? Uh, it will be, I'm, I'm looking at, um, I, I'm looking at uh, the process. I'm not really interested in the results. I want to see how INEC is going to manage this. I want to see how the people will manage this. I want to see how the, the candidates will conduct themselves. On Thursday, I think INEC will be signing, I think tomorrow, they will be signing a, a PIX pact in the States to conduct themselves uh, within the ambits of the land peacefully. And I think so far we've not had anything. Not like four years ago, if you recall what happened four years ago, uh, the video is still out there, and the, the brutalization of, of a, a, sitting, a sitting governor. You know, uh, that is not... Even now, some violence is uh, already being uh, recorded uh, in Ekiti The States. pockets of violence yes, here and yeah. there, but not at the level. By this time, we were already in Ekiti, and then the city 18 were there. We knew what we saw, the militarization of the, of the, of the process. I want to see how Bivas will, would work. I want to see how INEC will navigate the logistics. And Ekiti has a... It's not as, as, as treacherous a terrain like other places, you know. So, and it's a small, it's a small state. Uh, I, I want to also see the patterns of voting. But importantly, I also want us to understand that the political economy of 1993 and now is not the same. In 1993, if you look at, okay, now that the Prof has brought in economic indicators, what is the per capita income of the average Nigerian then and now? And why has the interest, why has, um, you know, money become so much, play, is play, why is it playing so much, uh, you know, um, f f why is it becoming a factor now? Is it possible that the people have been brought to their lowest ebb of poverty? That government now seems to become the only some the only form of you know economic emancipation that is available. These are questions you need to ask yourself because when the people when when politics has been weaponized and people have been impoverished, Nigeria is now seen as the cap, as the poverty capital of the world. I tell you, there's nothing you preach today about not selling your votes that people will listen to you. In a kitchen, for example, four years ago, people were saying that let them cook better soup today that, they are, that's, that is election day. They don't know what to happen tomorrow. But today, they want to cook a very good soup that has meat in it. And that tells you the mentality of, of people and how you know, politicians have so much impoverished them that they are willing to do whatever it takes. But, but now they are saying that cooking soup today uh, will not last for another four years. So I'm sure they have learned their lessons too. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen. Dr. Chima Amadi is a political scientist and chairman of the Center for Transparency Advocacy. And of course, he's been joined by Professor Yusufu Zwaka, who is a lecturer in political science at the University of Abuja here in the nation's capital. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Thank and uh, for you, our viewers out there, we want to thank you for investing your time with us. And we look forward to being with you again when we bring you a fresh edition of People, Politics, and Power. Bye for now.